This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon for Taking Care of Business. This is a very interesting show because this is a co-production with the Nassau County Bar Association, and we're going to be doing something quite interesting. We're going to try to do a radio show continuing legal education program all at the same time. With me is my guest, Frank Cantorino of Empire Discovery, and we're going to be talking about electronic discovery. And for those who are uh, not members of the Nassau County Bar Association, this is still great information. And for clients out there, for business people, this is really good information to have because electronic discovery is a reality. It's uh, growing in use, and it's things that uh, custodians of documents, business owners all need to be cognizant of. My name is Richard Solomon. I am an attorney. I'm a member of the New York State Bar. And uh, we're not here to give legal advice, but we're here to talk about uh, electronic discovery how it works, uh, definitions, uh, uh, you know, real life examples, and uh, hopefully to raise awareness. So, without further ado, Frank, thanks for uh, being with us today. Thanks, Rich. How are you? Great. And uh, let's start. So, what what is electronic discovery? So, electronic discovery, Rich, is basically the uh, electronic format of, of data you collect and you look at to determine your cases. So, it's kind of equivalent, I guess. Back in the day when people used to go in and just get boxes of evidence, now everything is stored on your computer in an electronic file. So it could be email, could be PDF, could be Word docs. And basically what we do is uh, we go in there and we capture the evidence and give it to you so you can look at it in the same way you you know crack open a box, but in, instead on a computer in a uh, reviewable format in a database. All right, let me ask a couple of questions. We often hear the word native format. What is that and why is that important? Sure. The native format is the actual document the way it appears. So what happens is when you go through the entire process, um, metadata gets extrapolated out. So metadata would be the to, the from, the CC, who created the document. But sometimes when you want to see documents, you want to see them in their native format. Uh, for example, like an Excel spreadsheet, you'd want to actually see that Excel in its format. What, that's what a native file is. So it's the actual file in its raw state. Raw state, correct. All right. How do we assure the authenticity of the collection? Well, that's a great question. So the best way to ensure the authenticity is to hire someone like us to come in and do it for you. Um, what happens is we have certified forensic collectors, m most companies do, where they go in, they're trained in this uh, art, uh, a lot of ex-law uh, enforcement people involved, the certification process involved, and they go in with, there's about three or four different recognized softwares by the courts, and they go in and they forensically capture it, they can testify it to what they've done, and they're really experts in that field, and I would highly recommend people going down that road as opposed to the road of self-collecting and relying on your clients or staff within your law firm to do this process. Have you used electronic discovery, what, would, what I would say are the smaller cases? Yes. Uh, I, you know, I would answer that question with this question. Who doesn't communicate with an electronic device, whether it's email, cell phone, tablet? The world has changed, and everyone is using some form of device. Now, what, what I've noticed is that in the federal courts, and this is just my, my limited worldview, it seems as though, and I've gone to a lot of classes uh, on electronic discovery, and it seems as though electronic discovery is very prevalent in the federal courts and really not so prevalent at all in the state courts, even, even in the commercial division cases. It, are, do, you, do you notice that? Do you have a lot of federal court cases? Yes. We do have a lot of federal court cases. The state courts are behind, but I think it really also depends um, on the state. Uh, obviously, New York is, is a little bit more uh, catching up. Some other states, we do a lot of work outside in, in the states of like Florida and down south, and they, the courts are definitely a little behind. But I, I, in the next couple of years, you know, just again, technology is, is forcing everyone's hand. You know, if everything is done via email or text message, 
you're going to get to a point where how are you going to do a case without electronic discovery? You know, what are you going to do? How are you going to get that phone and all the data off of it into something you can use in court in a real life scenario? And I think, like I said, in the next couple of years, you're not going to have an option. If you're not ahead of that curb, you're going to be left behind. Now, I do know that in some of the cases in which I've used uh, electronic discovery or electronic discovery holds, the first thing that I've done is probably with the initiation of the case is I filed a notice that says, please preserve all digital evidence. Um, I believe they call it an e-discovery hold in the trade. Yes. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've created, I, in fact, I think uh, you have forms and things like that. Uh, but, but essentially that's what I, as a lawyer, have done in my cases where I just send the notice out. I usually send it to uh, the opposing uh, side's client because when you serve the complaint, uh, there's no counsel necessarily uh, hired at that point, but I still want to make sure that there's a notice. And then as soon as there's an answer, I refile uh, the e-discovery hold. Uh, and I try to actually make sure that in my preliminary conferences that I repeat uh, either the request for electronic discovery or I at least preserve my rights to take electronic discovery. Uh, do you have any guiding examples or, or practice points for people about electronic discovery holds or the do's and don'ts? Uh, yes, the- I, I've actually... So you have to be very careful because every company, whether big or small, has retention policies. So if you do not do a lit hold, let's say, and this can be a very gray area where people say, well, our retention policy says we have to store emails for 60 days. After 60 days, we destroy everything. If you don't put that hold in place and the case lingers on or they get wind and they delete it, they can always hit you with, oh, well, our retention policy says X and this is when we deleted it. You didn't give us a hold, so therefore we weren't obligated to store any data. Happens a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's a good trick that a lot of big companies use, big law firms use these tricks. You have to be very careful. So retention policies drive that. So once you put the hold in place, it supersedes the retention policy of the corporation. So if it's 60 days, we purge all emails, and you have a litigation hold, guess what? If they purge those emails, now they have to explain to the judge why they violated the lit hold, which is much different than saying, we didn't get a lit hold. Our retention policy says this, judge. I don't know what to tell you. Right. And, then and you, you're yeah, kind yeah. of in a bad spot. Right. Because you could be caught with a charge of destruction of evidence. Absolutely. Yeah. The court is very strict on destruction of evidence, on spoliation, on anything that's done incorrectly, especially the federal courts, with electronic discovery. You know, it, for too long, there was a lot of games played. And they've really cracked down. And there's been many instances of even law firms getting into major trouble uh, for, you know, not doing it correctly. So that's one of the real areas where, you know, I've kind of been at the forefront is attacking these companies, the larger law firms, and working with the smaller law firms to help even the playing field. Because for too long, the bigger law firms were using electronic discovery to intimidate the small guy, bury them in data, and the knowledge wasn't there. They hired these e-discovery partners to intimidate and bully the smaller guy. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really changed the way cases are tried. You know, e-discovery should not be the underlying factor of why a case is won or lost. And that was starting to happen. And things are starting to change because people like myself are getting involved in trying to really help the small to medium-sized guy. Now, let's talk about the small to medium-sized law firm with the small to medium-sized client. What, what do you advise generally uh, for people on both the taking of discovery and the producing of material? How to, let's start first about taking from the other side. How, how would you go about You sit down with the lawyers, and let, let's say it's, it's you and I. So I sit down with you and I say, okay, I need to get emails and, the, and these are the topics. What, what, what does our discussion uh, consist of? So, so here's, here's what, we, when, if me and you are sitting down, we talk about, okay, these are the key custodians. These are the key time ranges in which I'm looking. Uh, that's the big key because when you're dealing with companies or entities, you know, these, typically these people have had emails for years. So we really try in order to get the data size down and get the amount of 
documents you have to look at, which is what it all comes down to, down. Uh, we really need to kind of pinpoint the time range, if it's possible. You know, if we can get down to a year, a month, the further down we can get and drill into what's really important, the better, you know, the better the case will be for you in terms of cost. And that's obviously what drives everything. You know, the big law firm wants to give you all of Joe Smith's emails for the past 10 years. That's his goal because he knows if he gives you 10 years worth of emails, the odds of you finding that smoking gun are very slim. But if me and you sit down and say, hey, we know Joe Smith was doing whatever he was doing in 2018 in this six-month period, now we just slice that data nine years off and how many months. It just changes the dynamic. So we really use those type of tools to go in and narrow it down. Now, once, it, you, once you've had it, I don't mean to corrupt you off, but I want no. to really cover a lot of territory for all the people listening out there. So once you've had your collection, is there a way for you to search? So let's say they did give you a mountain of evidence. Is there a way for you to search within that evidence to maybe find the needle in the haystack electronically? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's numerous different things we can do. And that can go down to something such as keywords, um, and we have a really amazing piece of software. Well, let's say you don't know. Let's say you don't know what, what happened. We can actually plug the data in, and we can see the most commonly used terms. Typically, when there's wrongdoing in corporate America, they don't come out and say it, and that goes back to the Enron, where they were using, like, hot-button terms to describe what they were doing. We have software that can go in and actually tell you how many times a word was used. So if you see, like, a weird word used, an enormous amount of times, you can then click on it and see that document and kind of see how it's used in, it, in an email. So it's a very cool piece of technology, and it's used really to uncover when you don't know. Right. At what point do we transition from the technology to eyeballs? Because at some point, th there's got to be a human factor of reviewing the information. There's still gut instinct, and there's still connecting the dots by attorneys and litigation support staff. So when, when does that transition take place? And what, what does what did the technology do? And then what do the humans have to do to pick it up from there? So the technology really kicks in once the data has been collected. And once we sit down and say, okay, these are the key terms, these are the key ranges, you know, this is what we're looking for. Then we would give it to you and say, you know, this is Joe Smith's emails from March to April. These are some of the terms that you, you know, the hits on the terms that you were looking for. And then you can go in there and eyeball them. Uh, we really try and use technology as much as possible to get through all the data. Because, again, the game is simple on the other side. Inundate you with data and make your life very difficult. So we can be as, you know, broad as possible, but we can also really fine in. So it really depends on the type of case you have and what you're looking for, and really how much information you have. Okay. Now, it's way back when, when I was a, a, a brand new lawyer, I remember participating in some very large, very, 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 very large uh, litigation. And, you know, the discovery was sort of like uh, one of the clients that we represented produced 2,000 boxes on day one. You know, and this was stuff that was reviewed and everything. So this was, you can imagine the amount of uh, people power. It's a lot of manpower. That was harnessed to search all these files, to copy everything, and then to box them up and then send them someplace that uh, reviewers could actually go and actually physically review. So the amount of time and money was probably astronomical in comparison to what's done now. Uh, just to show you a little bit uh, for people out there of, the, of how things have changed over the decades. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about client participation in the process. Uh, to me, and again, this is my practice pointer, I've always believed that the lawyer-client relationship is a partnership. Uh, how much should the client be participating in the electronic discovery in which they're seeking documents, and what can they actually do to help the process? Okay, so from where we stand on our side as the electronic discovery vendors and as the experts in that field, we want them to have as little access as possible to the data. What do I mean by that? Typically, what happens on the collection side when the client kind of dictates it, they kind of steer you towards a certain direction. And when you're doing a collection, 
it's kind of like the foundation of the house. You want to get everything, and you want it to be secure. You don't want to have any influence. You want to get a pristine image of, of that person's inbox, and then from there you can, you, the attorney, can talk to your client and say, give me some keywords, give me some dates, and drill down. But from the collection side, the client should not have any involvement because what happens, once the client starts to self-collect, starts to influence, it hurts the defensibility of the case because now if we get called before the judge, we didn't follow the proper protocol. We were guided by the client. So God forbid the client guides you in a way where he doesn't want you to see something, we're left, all of us, the attorney, the vendor, we're kind of left holding the bag. So it's a very dangerous, dangerous position to be in. And clients, more often than not, really try to do this. But we, it's really a, a, a tough battle where you kind of have to explain to them the ramifications. You know, they're not collection people, and you don't want them on the stand talking about how they collected data and having them be cross-examined by the other side. It's a, it's a very dangerous game and can lead to spoliation. It, it can lead to a lot of things and in some cases it could lead to you just losing the case and getting sanctioned all right so let, let, we only have like a minute and 45 seconds left in this particular segment but i want to start with this question which is could you talk a little bit about how you actually go to, to a place and collect data how does that work you know do you just dial in and suck everything out of the van i mean how does it really work so we can do it two ways we can go on site, and basically what we do is we go on site with software, and we'll bring drives, one drive. Let's say your computer is a terabyte. We'll go out with a terabyte drive, and we'll clone the computer exactly as it is. We'll do a mirror-by-mirror mirror image of the computer. So we have a pristine copy. So if someone ever says to us, like what you said to me earlier, how do we know this is, you know, it's all here, we have the whole image of the computer we can literally rebuild your computer as it stood on that day. So that's obviously one way. Remote collection is another way. Typically, a lot of people use cloud email now, Gmail, Yahoo. We can go up into the cloud using a software and pull it right down. All we need is username and password, and then you can reset it after we collect it. But we can go up, same scenario, we can go up, we can grab the inbox as it looks on your screen, pull it down, and we have a pristine copy of your entire Yahoo email box or Gmail box. All right, this is Richard Solomon with Frank Cantorino of Empire Discovery. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Keep it locked here. Thank you. You're listening to a podcast from LIU Studios. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating and review on iTunes and subscribe to this show on your podcast app of choice. For more of our programs or to support LIU Studios, visit WCWP.org. Hi, this is the great Fordini. You're listening to Richard Solomon on 88.1 FM WCWP. All right, welcome back. Richard Solomon co-production of the Nassau County Bar Association, taking care of business, also known as out of the question sometimes. And we're doing a continuing legal education class on the radio with Frank Cantorino of Empire Discovery in New York. EmpireDiscovery.com? Yes. All right, cool. And if you need any information, go there. All right, so let's talk about sort of one of the, the middle steps uh, in all of this, which is the meet and confer. I, I know that that's a term more often used in federal court, but uh, we, we see it a lot. What is meet and confer, and how is what is your view of meet and confer? Sure, and, and I also think that even in the state court now, and like I said earlier, as you're getting into a world where everything is electronic, uh, a meet and confer meeting or a meet and confer style meeting is very important. Meet and confer is where you get together with the other side and you talk about how you're going to transfer all this information. So I have, let's say I'm the defendant, and I have... X corporation, I'm going to talk to you, okay, these are the custodians I'm going to give you, these are all the employees of the company, this is all the dates I'm going to give you, this is their email, this is their cell phone, these are where the servers are. So this can be a very tricky process. And I highly recommend that, you know, if you don't have it internally at your law firm, you bring in someone who really understands the e-discovery landscape. This is where cases can be won and lost, because if you're not savvy and you're not educated, you can get badly hurt if the other side is. 
And now you were saying in pre-production that there are some attorneys whose whole dedicated, you know, scope of work in the law firm is just electronic discovery. Absolutely. Um, so how does that how does that work, and how and where do you fit into all of that? So yeah, there is uh, especially in New York City, there are many of the top 100 law firms that have created this position where they have e-discovery partners or e-discovery lawyers. They don't have their own clients. Their sole job within the firm is to handle e-discovery. And that can mean one of two things. That can mean handle e-discovery or that can mean make your life miserable. Mm -hmm. Uh, So typically what I've done in my consultancies is I've gone up against these people and really just kind of leveled the playing field. Um, They know how the e-discovery rules work, and they also know how data works. So they're kind of masters in that field, whereas most of your audience is probably experts in the legal field. So it's, it's a different game, and like I said earlier, the bigger law firms for a long time have been leveraging this scary e-discovery to intimidate and bully people who aren't as savvy. Right. In, in terms of the actual exchange, the physical exchange, are, are documents produced on hard drives? Are they put, posted on in the cloud? Is it all of it? Tell me how the mechanics work, especially... I'm sure there are cases where it's a flash drive, and I think there are probably other cases where it's just much bigger. So how does all that work? Yeah, so typically what will happen is um, we'll collect our data, they'll collect their data, they'll do their initial review, see what documents are relevant to the case, then they'll turn that subset of documents over, typically on hard drive, sometimes on like a file transfer if it's small enough, but most of the time it's hard drive, and they'll turn over to you, the agreed-upon specs, and that's another big thing you need to understand. You also need to discuss in the meet and confer how you want them to send you the data. If they send you 10,000 PDFs that aren't searchable, that's probably not going to be very easy for you to, you know, to manage. So that's another area where we really come in is we can actually help educate and tell you how you want them to turn that data over to you. You never want to take non-searchable PDFs, and sometimes that's what people offer you. So, you know, you want to try and get data in a format where you can put it into a a database if it's big enough and review it quickly. And these are all little tricks that the other side and easy discovery people will try to use, again, to bury you in data. All right, so let's talk about, you know, they back up the truck, and they, because that's how we did it in the old days. You know, they back up the truck and they, you know, deliver, you know, all this stuff. When, when you are the receiving party of information, how do you analyze it? What do you, what do you first look at? What do you look to see? Do you see about formatting and... Uh, yeah, when you receive it, so typically you want to nip it in the butt right in the beginning. You want to go into that mean conference and say, listen, this is how we want to receive data. We want to receive native, like what we talked about earlier, we want native files, we want metadata fields. Metadata fields are very key in terms of slicing and dicing through data because that will give you the to, the from, the CCC, the subject. You can use those metadata fields to search. So we would really lay out the specs at the beginning of the case and then demand that that's the way you receive it. So it's very important that you do that at the beginning because if you try and do it at the end, they're going to say, well, we gave you what we gave you. You didn't ask for it, and it's going to be too expensive. I've seen this happen so many times where people say, well, now it's too late. It's too expensive for us to change the way we gave it to you. And then they'll go before the judge and they'll say, listen, this is going to cost $100,000 to fix. You know, they didn't ask for it, so it's on them. And, you know, that's a tough argument. So it's very important that you set the terms with the other side at the beginning, and you're very clear. It's written out. It's agreed upon then you will not have the back the truck up problem, thank God. Right, so let's say that you're looking for like a word process document. I know that if you get certain kinds of word process documents, there's metadata that actually tracks the changes in the documents as opposed to a PDF which doesn't really have that. Could you talk a little bit about, about that and, and any insights you may have on that? Sure. Um, yeah, PDF is a PDF is obviously a tough a tough thing because a PDF is just a picture. But yes, with the with Word docs and different documents, you can see when changes were made. And oh, too you know too often again, this goes back to 
the forensic collection and back to getting the data in its pristine state. You know, typically people have a lot of those changes will be in there and we can go in and we can find them. And uh, uh, there's numerous different things you can do when you get inside into the forensic image uh, down to the point where you can almost see deleted data. Now, that's a, obviously another big factor. People think just because they deleted it off their computer, it's gone. But when you capture that forensic image, you also capture the Slack space, which also can open up Pandora's box to deleted files, deleted Word docs, deleted things that people didn't want you to see. And that must be very dynamic in, in litigation. Yes. But, you yeah. know, it, it goes to say, you know, and, and, and people talk about it all the time. You see it happening in, even in the real world now with Twitter. Nothing is ever deleted. So once you put something electronically out there, whether it's in social media or whether it's on your computer or whether it's down to what you were searching on your web browser, we can get it and we can see what you've done. Which is why the phone is the greatest <laughs> invention in the world. <laughs> it, it really is. And, and, you know, you're seeing law enforcement use forensics more and more. I mean, this is how things are happening. It goes back to what I said. And if people are not moving in that direction in terms of thinking of how am I going to handle cases with electronic data, you know, it's, it, they're just going to be left behind. Let's talk a little bit about data collection outside of the discovery process. Because this, this could be its own continuing legal education class and a whole different uh, radio show. But fundamentally, many, many, many entities out there, individuals, businesses, and the like, have social media between all the different kinds, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, I don't know, what it's, uh, whatever they are. Is there a way for you to collect information off of these public sites and confirm the accuracy and authenticity of your collection? Yes. Yes, we absolutely can. How does that um, work? How does that work? Let's say, let's say I see something that I, I think would be very, very useful in cross-examination at a deposition. Uh, how would, how, so I say, hey, Frank, look, uh, look at this thing in Facebook. They, they kind of gave some, you know, some information over here that I think uh, I'd like to capture. I'm afraid that maybe it'll get deleted. They'll take the account down. Mm -hmm. What, what do we do? So, yeah, that, that happens too often than not. Facebook and any type of social media, it, it comes down to speed, you know, getting to it before it gets deleted. But once you capture it, we have software that can capture it as pristine as we can capture, you know, your PC. You know, we can go out there, capture your profile, capture the entire Facebook profile as it exists with pictures, with posts. And I've seen too often than not, and, and I know you have too, where people have we've captured it and then it just magically disappears. <laughs> well, we, well, well, okay, let's give a real life story. So there was a case that we had, you and I, yes. and I called you up and I said, there's certain information in this particular part of social media in which it is very, very damaging to the other side. So I want to get it while we can. And you guys, I don't, I, I don't know what you did specifically, but you were, you were able to capture it. And then what was interesting is after we did capture it, very shortly thereafter, the most damaging post in the social media was vanished. And then, of course, when we brought it to court and we showed it, there were all kinds of, you know, this is outrageous. I don't know. It was in Photoshop. And that's where we came in and had you explain how you did the authenticity of the capture and how, uh, and a lot of it had to do with location and other things, you know, who was where, what, and when, and how you know, and that wasn't data. It wasn't um, identity theft or scraping or spoofing or. But if you could talk about that for a minute, that be yeah, sure. I mean, there's uh, there's a, uh, several pieces of software out there that that we use that actually captures the uh, captures the, the Facebook account or the Instagram account or Snapchat or whatever social media Twitter that, that you're using, and it it basically just captures it in a real life state. It gives you a full detailed a log of what was done, how it was done, that's fully usable in court. Um, all of our forensic software for everything we do uh, documents and lists every action that was taken, when it was taken, date stamped, time stamped, the profiles. So it's very tough to refute uh, that type of documentation. You know, it's not like somebody took a snapshot with their cell phone and said, look, look at his profile. Where you, you, there's just no questioning the authenticity of the software. Yeah. So we, we, we've really, uh, the, the software we use for social media is also used with cell phones and 
the logging is is very strong, and, and obviously that's the key is being able to, like you said, prove it. Um, now, do you, do you have like a certified it. person that captures it? Absolutely. Certain kinds of credentials? Okay, so what kind of credentials does that person so, possess? So that particular person uh, is NK certified, Celebrite certified. Those are some of the softwares that we use, X1 certified. Typically, when you use a forensics person, you want them to have a very strong IT or potentially law enforcement background and have certifications in all the softwares they're using. It's very important that you pick the right forensics person. Again, because like what happened in our case, if we didn't have someone that can you know, write an affidavit of what happened, document what happened with the logs in the software, that, that evidence that you worked so hard to get can just be thrown out. And, well, so, uh, and this is a practice point for people out there. The most important thing that I produced in that particular report you know, of what happened was the forensic examiner's credentials, which we actually you know, attached the resume uh, at the very, very end to show all the certifications and all the experience and all of the uh, you know, deep, deep, deep background that this wasn't just some person who just got out of school and just hit like save, <laughs> save web page as, you know, or just printed it off the computer and then scanned it. You know, it was, it was much more sophisticated than that. Um, yeah, you almost have to treat every forensic collection as if you're going to be called to testify. And that's typically the motto we employ and we use. So we assume that the collection is going to be questioned by the other side and that we may ultimately have to go into court and testify as to how we did the collection and the process and steps we took. And if you take that approach and you treat it that seriously, um, you know, you're never going to have a problem. Right. Now, I, I know we kind of touched on this a little bit before, but I want to go back to it. In order to have multiple users access to the subset of materials, do you... Is there a way to put all the material on a cloud that's actually searchable and manageable as opposed to being sort of an unwieldy mess of just, you know, everybody having a clone of a hard drive? Yes. Uh, the industry has really moved towards one dominant software. It's called Relativity. So Relativity is exactly what you're speaking about. It's a hosting web-based platform. So it, it's a platform where you can log in. You can have as many people as you want log into the system and you can review the documents typically in either a native format or it has its own text rendering where it'll kind of render the email, the to, the from. Again, you'll have all your metadata fields, who sent it, when, you know, who received it, who was BCC'd, who was CC'd, and then it'll list the subject. And then if you want to see the native file, the actual original email, or if you want to see an attachment, that's there too. But it's a cloud-based software. It's very solid. It's pretty much the, the gold standard in the e-discovery world. And that's typically where we, we push people to review the documents as opposed to, you know, pushing it into an outlook. Typically we see a lot of people do that where they'll take those emails and they'll load them into their outlook, which is another disaster because then you're manipulating metadata fields. So you have to be very careful. I, what, what do you do? We only have two minutes. Again, this is very fast moving, so it's, it's a great uh, subject. What do we do with something like this? Uh, you're collecting from someone who has proprietary software. Maybe they have some kind of custom-made manufacturing process uh, software or some kind of accounting or whatever. Just say it's custom-made. Mm -hmm. So you get it in native format, but, but then what do you do with it? Because you, you almost need the software to read it. How does that work? And we that, is, that is a very yeah. challenging uh, process. So when you process that data or that, that, stuff, that proprietary stuff, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. And in some of those instances, you may just be better off converting things to PDFs. You might be better off capturing it almost as like a picture. Because if it's proprietary, and we do get this, people have different proprietary tools, it's very, very hard to get it to open on your machine. You know, we may be able to open it because, you know, we bought the software and we can open it, but... You might not. So when you put these type of uh, tools into platforms, the only way you can really open it is if you have that software. So that's an instance where you would have to either PDF or create some kind of Excel. You know, we, there's a lot of data manipulation that will go into something like that, depending on the program. Right. Because the problem is, like, I, I noticed that sometimes 
party A will create, a, say, a word processing document and using some kind of software. And then they send it to somebody who's friendly and, you know, whatever, and, I, and they get the email back, can't open, uh, you know, because it was written in software A and the other side only has program B. So how do you deal with that? Now, we only have 40 seconds left on this segment, but um, do you have to actually maybe try to work with the other side to be able to read the material in their proprietary software? Yeah, and that comes down to, you know, that could come down to even us bringing in, again, our forensic expert sitting down and kind of getting an understanding of, of the root basis of the software. You know, what's it built on? Can we create something? And again, that we do deal with that where we come across customization where we have to do that. Sometimes it's internal, internal emails. You know, people have like their own company internal processes where they communicate, not via email. So you do come across this type of stuff all the time. And there's different ways we, you can handle it. But you really, again, those are things you need to have conversations at the beginning about so you know what you're dealing with. It's right. very tough to deal with it after the collection. I right, will be right back. Richard Solomon, Frank Cantorino from Empire Discovery, EmpireDiscovery.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to a podcast from LIU Studios. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a rating and review on iTunes and subscribe to this show on your podcast app of choice. For more of our programs or to support LIU Studios, visit WCWP.org. I'm Roger. I'm Tom. And I'm Vic. And we're Blue Race. Race. And you're You're listening listening to to Richard Richard Solomon Solomon on WCWP 88.1 FM. Richard Solomon, Frank Cantorino, we are giving a continuing legal education class on the radio. Uh, we are doing this with the Nassau County Bar Association and, uh, for, and, and for its members and for the business community out there and for lawyers out there all over the place and people who are interested in electronic data discovery want to know more. Again, this is not legal advice, but we're trying to really help people understand the framework, background, definitions, and mechanics of electronic discovery. Uh, by all means, you should go out there and find as much information as you can from a number of different sources. As electronic discovery keeps changing, technology is ever increasing, more omnipresent, and uh, rules are expanding, and courts are becoming much more hands on when it comes to all this material. With that said, thank you, Frank Nantorino from Empire Discovery, for being my very, very knowledgeable and gracious guest. My and uh, we are going to continue. Uh, helping to provide practice pointers and tips and some basic background to the legal community. Uh, so is, is electronic discovery used in domestic matters such as, like, say, a divorce or family court, things like that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've done a number of cases. Again, it goes back to what we said earlier where you know, everyone's communicating electronically. Uh, cell phones are absolutely critical in uh, divorce and, and any type of case involving the family. Uh, people, <laughs> people leave a lot on their phone. And uh, a lot of people also think that when you delete something on your phone, it's gone. And that's also uh, a very untrue statement. So typically, yes, text messaging uh, is obviously very big in divorce. Uh, photos, believe it or not, are also very big because uh, people, do a lot, <laughs> people do leave a lot of incriminating photos, incriminating messages, girlfriends, boyfriends, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all very, very heavily used in, um, in those type of cases. So, we've, yes, we've absolutely seen an uptick. And I think we've actually, <laughs> eDiscovery has actually made that process a lot easier to prove uh, cheating and different infidelities that go on in, in those type of divorce cases. Now, as I understand it, if you have an, an electronic photograph that the cell phones put sort of geophysical data like time and location on the photograph that you can retrieve? So it tells you where the photograph was really taken? Yes. How does that work? Um, it's actually funny. Uh, there was a case with uh, the McAfee guy who got a... Uh, that's how they caught him. Again, law enforcement uses it all the time. So typically with your photos, it's location and, and location, date, and time. Uh, so you can absolutely track down... Um, anyone with a picture. So, and the te- again, so in some aspects with technology, we view it as such a great thing. Um, the actual people who are committing the wrongdoings haven't figured out that, 
you know, cell phones are actually their undoing in a lot of cases. So, yeah, we can go in and, uh, like I said, capture anything from a phone. And Facebook is also very good, obviously, when people do posts on Facebook. A lot of times they'll put a picture, they'll put a uh, their location, uh, and, and it time stamps it right on Facebook. <laughs> and then does and can you if if you were to take the photo off of Facebook, can you then tell where the photo was taken, where it was in the world? Like, like, yep. if, if, like if there's a beach picture, mm-hmm. and you know, let's say there's someone holding a iced tea under a palm tree, uh, can you tell whether it's in Florida or Hawaii or Tahiti based upon? Yeah, I mean, the- typically there's again, and it depends on the sophistication of the person. There is ways to turn those type of things off, but the average user of a phone does not know how to do that. Um, and even with Facebook, you know, there's ways to turn off locations, and sometimes you'll even get prompted. Um, you'll see a message, you know, location on your phone, and people just ignore it. And, and that tends to be the problem with e-discovery. Uh, even back going back to, to emails, people don't, it hasn't yet sunk into people's head that, Whatever they write, whatever they post, whatever they put out there, it's there forever, and it's literally digital evidence. Right now, now I'm going to say this is a public service to the people out there. Be very mindful of posting pictures of children, uh, because uh, people with not necessarily the best intentions uh, can see you know ages of children, locations where they are, where they frequent, and I've I've read numbers of articles that say uh, in a very cautionary way that be be, be judicious in your postings of social media involving, you know, minors because of their vulnerability. Um, and the fact that the internet really is worldwide and anybody can, can search it. And, and there is a lot of sophisticated tools out there to actually look and see what's un- underneath a lot of the pictures and data and things like that. So I just want to put out there. It's, it, it's nothing I have personal knowledge of, but I've read it over and over again. So it must, must have some important, um, you know, message out there to the general public about safety. All right, moving on, uh, when, when in, in, say, like domestic matters or in business disputes, um, especially with money and honesty and things like that, uh, where, does, where does the connecting of the dots come in and how do you do that using technology and probably connecting testimony, documents, data, and pictures? How do you weave all that together? Because... Obviously. Yeah, I can actually give you a great example. I worked on a case about three years ago where the CFO was embezzling money out of the company. That was the way we were originally approached. And we went in and we do a forensic investigation, which is similar to collecting the data, where we go in and we collect the data, but then we sit there and we examine the data. So we look at what happened. And what we noticed in this case, yes, the CFO was absolutely taking the money. But there was one problem that nobody knew. The IT guy was in cahoots with the CFO. So the IT guy was going in and deleting all the incriminating (laughs) evidence. So no one could understand where these emails were and where all of the, you know, shady stuff was. Everyone knew what was going on. But again, it's not what you know. It's what you can prove. So what we were able to do is we were able to get the actual logs and see that the IT guy was deleting the CFO's data. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, now, so it was a very interesting case. Now, were you hired by the company because they were suspicious? Were you hired by law enforcement? How, how, the CEO. Ah, so, that, so what was it? there was a dip in profits and then that alerted somebody? Yes, there was a major dip in profits, and no one could really understand why. And now we know why, because the IT guy was working hand-in-hand, hand, which can be tough. You know, the IT guy is kind of the gatekeeper to all of your data and all of your information. But again... Uh, in the e-discovery world, no one is above reproach, and right. anybody can be caught. Um, and that's the good thing about it. So let's let's continue with this. So have there been instances where someone says to you, I, I just need to collect, or I need to get a subset of my own material. I have, I don't know, let's have, I don't know, 100,000 emails. And I need to do some kind of financial investigation about monies that may be owed to me, and I got to piece together all these transactions because I got a little percentage of a commission here and there and whatever, and I need to know how to make my claim. How would that work? Sure. I mean, we've, we've done many a case like that where someone will come to us similar to what you said, and we can go in and we can kind of piece everything back together. 
Um, it, it, the good thing about the forensic, like I, like I continue to say, is it leaves that footprint. So any type of wrongdoing, any type of financial discrepancy, we can kind of go in and track down where and why and how it happened and then present it to the end client. Does this work um, especially well with email? It works great with email. Email is the easiest source to, uh, to go through. The only time you run into issues with email, again, it goes back to retention policies. So if you come across a company where they delete emails after a certain amount of time, or even cloud emails, because sometimes people purge cloud too, that, that's really the only time you run into problems piecing things back together is when there's gaps in data. So let me ask you about BYOD, bring your own device. So let's say, for example, I work for a big company, but I bring my laptop and I use my personal email and a burner phone to conduct activity. How would you be able to kind of capture that or learn of the existence of that Uh, sort of a fishing expedition? I would tell you BYOD is an extremely dangerous process because it doesn't really exist. Once you bring your own device and you put company data and or email on it, the whole thing is discoverable. So my first piece of advice to you would be buy a separate BYOD device. <laughs> uh, do not put any personal stuff on there because, again, anything that's on there, if there's a company litigation or something goes wrong, is discoverable. There's no way to segregate it. Um, we take your computer, we take everything. So if there's things on there you don't want out, you don't want to do it. So my first piece of advice with BYOD is make sure that your personal is separated from your work on a separate device, separate computer. I know it sounds like a lot of money, an extra 1400 bucks for the laptop, but it'll save you a lot of money if anything ever goes wrong. Well, I, I kind of heard a story, you know, one of those things where you're waiting around in the courthouse where somebody uh, had a laptop that was forensically examined and and it was discovered that the guy was a problem gambler and, you know, that kind of thing. So personal data, you know, uh, really, really can be discovered and can be quite embarrassing. Um, Any other great, you know, we only have a few more minutes left, which is amazing. Uh, Any probative stories, any insightful stories or experiences that yeah, that would be good learning points for our audience out there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd say over the past five years, I have worked personally on about 10 different matters where, as we were speaking earlier, where the client went to the lawyer and said, here's all my emails for the case. Um, and unfortunately, that was not the case. And they went before different courthouses, different judges, a lot in the federal sector, and were found to not have given all the emails. So there was a level of embarrassment. And once you go down that road, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you, and you go before the judge and you're standing in court and you said, here's all our emails. And the guy on the other side says, those are all your emails? What about this email? And you're standing before the judge and there's a relevant document that you don't have. Uh, um, again, I'm not an attorney. I'm an e-discovery expert, but I can't imagine that there's nothing more embarrassing than when that moment happens to you. And unfortunately, when that moment happens, that's when forensics gets really expensive. And I've seen too many times, like I said, 10 to 15 of these type cases where someone's come to me and say, hey, listen, the judge basically you know, ripped us, is accusing us of spoliation. We didn't give all the data. Can you help me? And at that point, the only way to help you is to literally document and take everything in the company. Because once the other side can prove that you withheld a relevant document, it's Armageddon. And I can't stress enough to your audience and to anyone who's listening, the forensic piece is not the most expensive. It's the cheapest, and it's the most important part of e-discovery. It's the foundation. It's your house. It's your foundation of your house. And if it's not strong, the whole house can fall on top of you. And I've seen it happen at least 15 times in the past four to five years. So when a case is over, how, how is the e-discovery content 
handled and how is it destroyed and how do you in other words let's say there's we have a confidentiality order you know it's only for litigation only internal review attorney's eyes and attorney staff eyes only and whatever the case is over how does how does everyone be assured that when the case is over the data really is erased especially when nothing really is deleted how does that all work yeah so what we would do is we would issue a certificate of destruction uh similar to the way it worked with the paper, right? You review your paper documents, you send them to the shredder, the shredder hands you a certificate of destruction. It's the same thing in our world. Typically what we would do, we'd export out off of one of our databases all the data. We've delete, we would delete everything. We'd give you back the forensic images that we captured. All the drives related to the case we hand to you. We delete it off our network. We provide you with a certificate of destruction. And we all go on our way. Um, now, would you do that for the law firm that hired you as well? Because if you transfer... Typically, yeah. We would, whoever, whoever hired us and paid us is who we would, we would... Or if the client said, hey, give this to our law firm, we would do that. We would typically act in, in accordance with whoever was driving the case and whoever was instructing us what to do. Right, but what I'm saying is do you, do you actually help the law firm delete their files that they may sure. have had? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean... In most cases, we would just purge everything. It just really depends on what um, what what you guys want us to do. But typically, we want to get rid of it as fast as humanly possible once it's over, because you know we want to be it's over, the case is over. We we want our we want our data back. We give it back to you, and we want our storage back. <laughs> right. Okay. So we only have three minutes left, so uh, I guess just. If you're a business and let's say you really have a lot of physical documents and you think it's important to retain them for whatever reason, because it's an intellectual property and you want to keep it, but you don't really have the space for it. Is there a way to scan everything, maintaining the integrity and authenticity so that if you ever needed to assert a claim that you kept the material, but you still, that it was as good as keeping the paper? Do you have a way of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, you can digitize everything. So we, you, you can, going back to what you said about paper, you can digitize all your records, throw them on hard drives, and hard drives are a lot easier to store than boxes. So you can digitize all your records, and that's another big part of our business. A lot of people are going in that direction. You know, real estate is expensive. Uh, the right. Hard drives in a drawer are very cheap. Right. And I guess you can do things with redundancy, so there's backups. Absolutely, backups. yeah. I mean, people have to understand that you know, electronic data and putting things on drives, it's, it's no different than keeping a box. I mean, it's, it's just as secure. There's ways, God forbid, a drive doesn't work. We have technology to get drives to work. So technology has really caught up, and in this day and age, you really don't need to lug boxes. You really don't need to throw your back out trying to go to the courtroom. Everything is electronic, and, you know, you can use the technology to your advantage. It's, it's a lot easier to do that than it is to take the actual data off of the phone, data off of things, and convert it to paper. That's expensive and not the most efficient way to be doing it. All righty. I want to thank Frank Cantorino for an incredibly insightful and important uh uh, background on electronic discovery uh, and, and how it works in litigation. For those who are look, listening to this for CLE credit, continuing legal education credit, the CLE code for this class is NCB319. NCB319. I'll say that one more time. NCB319. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Frank Cantorino of Empire Discovery, EmpireDiscovery.com. I'm Richard Solomon. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, is there an email that people can send a, uh, an email to you uh, to follow up? Sure. It's uh, F. Cantorino, C A N T E R I N O, at empirediscovery.com. All righty. So, for all those who listen, thank you for participating in this class. And for the business public out there, hopefully, we've enlightened you a little bit about uh, documents, document retention, discovery, and some legal dynamics. Thank you all. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you.